what do miniatures and fun fairs have in common, other than their high cost of entry? It's face painting, the bane of brushes everywhere. But it doesn't have to be. The basics are pretty simple, it's the execution on such small parts that could be the problem. And brushes can only get so small. Color can also be a factor. But not today, since the faces I want to paint are a bit more alien in nature. The Eternal Dynasty Warriors from One Page Rules actually have a pretty simple escape from faces if you want, and that's helmets. But I actually really love aliens in my sci-fi models and wouldn't mind showing off their alien faces. And conveniently enough, <clears throat> not at all what gave me the idea for this video, there is a graphic with not only their skin color, but also a lot of really cool face paints. So this video is going to be a bit of a flurry of faces where I not only show a few ways to get that purple skin, but also try a couple of those face markings and go over a few ways to steady your hand to get such small details. The first method for purple skin will just be a base shade and highlight. The purple of the faces is saturated and dark, but still not perfectly saturated to my eye, so I'm just going to use a dioxazine purple for the base. But to lighten it up a bit, I actually use some of the gray primer so it desaturates it ever so slightly. This becomes the base to the skin, which gets a few coats to make sure it's nice and flat. For the shade part, it's really going to be up to your preference. A purple wash from Army Painter would be simple and standard. GW washes would work too, though I don't think GW have a purple wash anymore. If they do, I just didn't ever pick it up for myself. Contrast, quick shade, or speed paint from their assorted companies would also work, but you'd want to thin it down and I don't have any of those in a purple so I can't even demonstrate. Dioxazine purple is a pretty strong tinting color so just mixing some of that into some medium and either thinner or water would also work pretty well to give a wash. Just make sure you're not using too much pigment or too much thinner so it settles more naturally. Purple ink in medium should also work too, though I'd say you want to make sure it's a matte medium, since one thing I can assume about these aliens is that they're not made of glass, and ink alone will tend to dry with a glass-like sheen to them. Some matte varnish or medium should kill that. After whatever wash is used dries, it's time for some touch-ups with the base color again. Doing this is really all about making sure we're covering any pooling that happened not exactly where we wanted it or in the case of the ink, to counter some of the staining that happened. Do this all over the flat areas, staying away from where the wash pooled the most. We'll want to do another wash, but with a much darker color, like black, just to match what's going on with their eyes in the artwork. So just a dot of the dark wash in their eyes. It doesn't have to be fully black either if you'd rather not go right to black. Just mix a bit of the previous wash you used into the new wash and use that mix instead. This is where we have a bit of a choice to make. Highlighting convention tells us to use a lighter purple to highlight with, which would just be to add white. And I think just adding a little bit of white would work, but this might end up feeling a little pale. I mean, I don't really know what a pale purple alien would look like, so this is probably fine, but it's also an opportunity to play with color a little bit and instead of adding white, add a bit of a lighter magenta. It'll shift the color for the highlights so we see them as highlights, but without getting too bright and pale with too much white. Whichever way you choose though, the important thing is what we want to be highlighting, and we can use the artwork here to help us. But for most faces, the important parts are always the top of the brows and forehead, the top of the cheeks, the nose, and the top of the chin. Though since these guys don't have chins, I'm gonna count nose and chin as one. And because I felt the sides of their heads come out far enough, they also get a bit of a highlight. With all the same colors, there's a few other methods I want to try. Another method I'd like to do is layering from black with stippling. Who's to say their faces can't be made from scales or textured skin? And it uses all the same colors except starting with the shade, in this case just the plain diox purple, and using a nice fine point and a thinned mix. Then it's just a series of dots, starting with them everywhere but in the deepest of recesses, 
Then as the color gets lighter or more magenta, those dots will hover more towards those highlight points. I mentioned before giving the face the right structure, but with this, it'll get a little more texture as well. The last one is for airbrush users. With a little control at the end, the highlights can pretty much make themselves after a couple easy first steps. We'll go from dark to light again, so step one is just to spray the diox purple all over the head as a base coat. For step two, it's the purple and gray mix again as a general zenithyl spray, so a nice 45 degree angle to the model, but all the way around its head. The back will be pretty dark because of the way their heads crest, but that's okay. Then step three. This is where we really want to be gentle with the color and really position the angle right. We want the airbrush to be pointing down across the face as our light source from above and pretty parallel to it as well, so like a 10 degree angle almost. Then in light sprays and thin coats, we just slowly build up a lighter layer. If we have the angle right, the only thing the spray should touch are the head, the brows, the top of the cheeks, and the nose chin, just like they're supposed to. When it comes to the face markings, I'm going to start easy and work my way to the harder ones. First one will be this simple offset yellow stripe, because with it, I can show the idea of following the underlayer so that it matches the same lighting, but with a different color. And it starts with a base coat of white. Why white? Because I want the final yellow to be bright, which is best done over white. I find the easiest way to get nice even edges when it comes to freehand like this is to actually start thin and extend the line outwards. So I did just a single line down the side of the face and extended it more and more until I was happy with the width of it, not worrying about an even coat to start. Once it was blocked in and dry, then I started filling in the color a bit more densely with more coats. In the art, it looks like the yellow comes from a brown shade. So in the shadows, I'll use a light azo but with a bit of raw umber in it, which is a more yellowish brown. Check up here to find out more about browns and brown pigment. I only put this in the shadows, trying to follow the recesses where the wash had pooled in the purple layers. Now that we have the shades, we just need to do the highlights, but because we started with the white, really all that means is filling in the rest of the bare white with the azo yellow, blending it into the shade a little bit so they overlap and create a medium shade. One more step up in difficulty. This time I'm going with the sideways double stripe. What will make this more difficult is getting the line to feel straight even though it's going over a rigid surface. We don't need a base of white, so I can at least start with a desaturated blue. How I like to block them in is to try and get a pretty thin line and skip anything that goes too deep. Then when it comes to the deep parts, try and connect up ends of what's already been painted in a way that makes sense. And even though this is pretty small and the lines very thin, I try and make them as straight as possible along the edges. The highlight is then pretty simple as we just have to follow the line again, but once again, skip all the deep parts. Time to do one of the hard ones now. I quite like this one with the green under the eyes. It has some break points and small dots, and the line's not flat, so just needs to follow the curve of the face and doesn't really span any shades, so I don't need to worry about shade colors which means this one is really just going to be about having a steady hand. There's a few ways to do that. One I do is to lock my hand to the table, or in this case my wet palette so that I can hold the model in frame for my camera. By having your hand rest on something, it eliminates one direction of movement, up and down, so that even if you do have a bit of a shake, it'll only be side to side. Another tactic is to actually hold my breath while I'm touching the brush to the model. It's something I've been doing unconsciously for a long time, and I've seen it in video games as well. You spend stamina to hold your breath for a better aim kind of deal. It's not a breathe in deep and hold it either. It's basically I breathe in, then gently exhale, then when my body is most relaxed, hold for a few seconds and go in with the paint, then finish exhaling. It keeps slight movements in my arm still for just those few seconds while I concentrate. The last thing I do is actually touch the painting hand to the holding hand. You don't really see it since my hands aren't in frame a lot, but I'm always touching my pinky to either my model holder or my other hand. By making that physical connection with the hands, they get a better sense of where each other is and move more as a cohesive unit rather than two separate moving contraptions trying to line up. 
And if painting lines on faces seems like the wrong time to practice your fine steady movement, then there is at least one thing no one on earth will ever judge you for not getting perfect because we've all been there. Good luck. Please subscribe if you'd like to see more videos like this one or just other fun things to do with painting miniatures. And until next time, enjoy your own painting journey.